Genesis chapter 4 and let's read verse 6 and then we'll read the first part of verse 7. And we're going to read it in the Amplified. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? And why do you look annoyed? If you do well, believing me and doing what is acceptable and pleasing unto me, will you not be accepted? Verse 7b, we are putting it in a diagram form. God said, and if you do not do well, but ignore my instruction, that is step one. Step two, sin crouches at your door. Step three is desire is for you to overpower you. And step four, you must master it. Is that okay? Right. So what we want to do today is to actually take a closer look today by the grace of God at this first step. We want to look closer so that we can take instruction. Now, as you have noticed, step two and three, they are the soccer punches. They are the dangerous upper cord that the devil will use to flatten and waste Cain's life. Okay, this is devil's ace card. Step two and step three. Let's look at step two and three again. Sin crouches at your door. His desire is for you to overpower you. Step one is the entry point that allowed the devil to gain entry and to gain access into Cain's life. What is step one again? And if you do not do well, but ignore my instruction. That is the step one. That is the shink in the armor. That is the break in the wall. That is the point of entry. And then step four, which is actually where we are going, is when God gave Cain a secret of victory. God gave Cain in step four the way out the way of victory, the way of repentance. And what was that? He said, but you must master it. But you must master it. Now, for us to understand what Cain needs to do to gain victory and master the sin that crouches at his door, this sin that wants to overpower him, this sin that wants to destroy him, for us to understand what Cain needed to do, we are going to compare this Genesis chapter 4, verse 7 that we have read and we are going to compare it to another instruction that God gave to the believer in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 to 9a. So we are going to do that. And what I'm going to do with 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9a is to do exactly this first step that we did for Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. We are going to do that same first step for 1 Peter chapter 5. Again, we are going by the first step. Remember, we are reading from down up. So be vigilant because that is step one. So be vigilant. So be sober. Be sober. Be vigilant because step two, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walk it about. Step three, seeking whom he may devour. Step four, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, let me read it without saying step one and two. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Praise the Lord. You can see that actually this paralleled very nicely what we read, the instruction that God gave to Cain. So here again, we're talking about 1 Peter chapter 5. Here again, step 2 and step 3 are the soccer punches. Here again, the dangerous uppercut. If you if you imagine that you as a Christian, I as a Christian, you are inside the boxing ring and your enemy is the devil. Now this is the secret weapon that the enemy has. This secret weapon to cause us to be knocked out. And this is why it is important for us to understand this. This is the soccer punch. This is the dangerous upper court that can flatten and make the life of any Christian ineffective and unfruitful. Again, it is that step two and three. What is step two and three again? Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. This is the reality of our spiritual warfare. And that warfare started way, way back in the Garden of Eden. And we touched that in previous episode. 
And that warfare continues throughout the story of the whole Bible. We encounter that warfare whereabout in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. On, mount, on the mountain of temptation, we encounter this warfare. In the garden of Gethsemane of our Lord Jesus Christ, we encounter that warfare. What's the stake? Number one, your adversary, the devil. Your adversary. We have adversary. This is the reality of the warfare that you and I are facing. The Bible says your adversary, the devil. Remember, we are looking at the soccer punch, which is step two and three. He said your adversary. Now, that word adversary literally means an accuser in a trial before a judge. For example, if you read Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, we saw a very good illustration there. I will read it in the Amplified Classic, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Then the guiding angel showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. We've talked about, we've touched on the angel of the Lord. This is actually a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. I will read it again. Then the guiding angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at Joshua's right hand to be his adversary and to accuse him. You see, and this was exactly what happened in the case of Job. You remember that the Bible says that you and I, we have an adversary, an accuser. And the Bible name it for us. This is very clear. This is very, very clear. There's no confusion here. You and I, we have an adversary and he is the devil. The devil. And the Greek word for the devil is uniformly used in the Septuagint for the Hebrew Satan. So both devil and Satan, they express the same thought. Satan also means adversary. One who withstands is an opponent. He's not your friend. He doesn't have any good plan for you. If it seems, if the world, if the flesh and the Satan seems to be drawing you closer, it's because they are fattening you up for the kill. Satan, the world, sin and flesh and everything that is in the world, the Bible says they are an opponent. They are one who is standing against us. They are enemy. So the Bible says your adversary is the devil. The devil, remember, is the same is the same expression, is the same thought as Satan. And that word devil simply means an accuser, somebody that slander. The Bible says your adversary, the devil. Then the Bible tells us what it's all about. The Bible says as a roaring lion. It's not as a laughing gentleman. It's not as a cuddly friend. The Bible says your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion and that phrase a roaring lion is an impression of a hungry strong fierce cruel lion it's a lion that is hungry and in, his, and in his hunger it is cruel it is fierce it implies its violence and insatiable thirst for his prey this is an animal that is set out to kill in other words this opponent that, has, <laughs> that you have entered into the ring with is a mad, raging enemy. Is a mad, raging enemy. This is not a game. This is not fantasy. This is war. And if you don't fight, you will die. And I'm praying that you and I will not die. But if we don't fight, the Bible says fight the good fight of faith. You are in the ring with an enemy that have no mercy and will show no mercy. And that is what this scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5 is bringing out. And that was exactly what God was telling Cain. Your enemy, your adversary, the devil, as roaring lion. Remember, we are looking at the soccer punch, step two and three. He said, he walketh about. What does it mean? Actually, that means he's prowl, prowling about. He's diligent and restless in his attempt. Walk about. He's diligent. He's intentional. He's, 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 he has his, his work 
cut out. He has a plan. The Bible says he's walking about, he's prowling about, he's diligent and restless in his attempt. Walk about seeking whom he may devour. Just in case if the, the reality of what we are saying has not struck us, the Bible says he's seeking whom he may devour. Literally, that it means he's looking for somebody whom he will gulp down or swallow. And that implies the thought of total destruction. This is the plan of the devil. The Bible says the enemy does not come but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If he's coddling you, if he's cutting you, if he's befriending you, it's a lie. This is his end game. The Bible says, seeking whom he may devour, whom he may gulp down and swallow. Here, the thought is that of total destruction. Seeking whom he may devour. He's not looking for somebody to just hurt lightly. You want to swallow up and utterly destroy by himself or by his instrument that he has put in place. And this is the plan of the devil for every human particularly Christian. Once he noticed a chink in an armor, once he noticed a weakness, once he got an entrance into a life, he will lash on it until it destroyed. Again, going back to Cain, this is what God was telling Cain, you have opened the door. There's a chink in your armor and the devil has snuffed it out as I've noticed it and is crouching to pounce on you. Beware. Remember, we are using this as an instruction to help us understand Genesis chapter 4. So we have taken step 2 and 3. Your adversary, the devil, as a royal lion, walk about seeking whom he may devour. We have looked closely into those portions. That is what is at stake. And what we are saying is that God is saying that this is not a game. Now let's now go to step 1 of that first Peter chapter 5 that we read. Step 1. By inference, show us how the devil can gain entry into believer's life. Now, unlike in the case of Genesis chapter 4, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he stated it in a positive way. And by inference, we can see the way that the devil can gain entry into believer's life. Step 1 says, be sober, be vigilant. In other words, if I am not sober, if I am not vigilant, that will be a chink in my armor. If I'm not sober as a Christian, if I'm not vigilant as a Christian, that will open up an entrance that the devil can lash on, can attach itself to, can deposit a virus that can then cause step two and three. When the Bible says be sober, be vigilant, it's, it's actually what picture is like when a shepherd cry out to warn his colleague to say there is a lion prowling about on the periphery of where the flocks are. The, 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 the lion is in darkness. Now, I won't have enough time to talk about shepherding in those days. I think we've touched on this here and there. So here is giving us a word picture where the shepherd that seems to be keeping the watch cry out and warn the colleague to say there is a lion out there in the darkness that is trying to breach the periphery and warning them to get up, wake up, and secure the periphery. And that is exactly what God is saying here. Be sober, be vigilant. And the tense used here is a vivid expression of the necessity for instant action, as though he was saying, wake up, rouse yourself to sobriety and watchfulness. Wake up, arouse yourself to watchfulness that is the sense in which he was saying here and you can compare that to what we read in first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 6 when paul wrote and said therefore let us not sleep as do others but let us wash and be sober and that is the sense here wake up wake up there's an enemy that want to kill that want to steal that want to destroy be sober be vigilant. That word sober means to keep your appetite and passions under proper control. To keep your appetite and passion under proper control. You cannot allow it all to hang out. You cannot just say, if it feels good, let's do it. No. 
No, that is lasciviousness, concupiscences, and all those other things we've mentioned in in episode way, way back when we we're talking about sexual sin. Keep your appetite, sexual appetite, with respect to food, desire to be rich, and all those appetite, desire, inordinate desire. There's nothing wrong in righteous goodness, but there's everything wrong in covetousness. There's everything wrong in greed. There's everything wrong in the flesh. So that was sober mean to keep your appetite and passion under proper control. And the word vigilant means to be watchful. To be watchful because your enemy is subtle. Your enemy has malicious design. I said, be watchful. Be watchful. So it's as if he's saying here, just like we said, awake and keep awake, sleep no more. Obviously, you know, we are not talking about physical, not sleeping physically. He's saying that we must have our spiritual antenna up at every time. We must be on the alert. It is just like those 10 virgins, isn't it? All of them slept, but five of them had extra oil. So he's saying awake. It's as if he's saying awake and keep awake, sleep no more. And that is what he's saying there in step one. So we've put it positively, but negatively, if we don't do what step one have told us, if we are not sober, if we are not vigilant, which is exactly what Ken did, he was not sober, he was not vigilant, he did not do well. And that was why the enemy find an entrance into his life. Praise the Lord. Now, step four. Remember, we've done two and three, we've done one now. Step four. Step four in First Peter chapter 5 that we read is the way out. Just like God gave Cain the way out. Step four is our way out. Is our victory. Is our weapon of warfare. So let's look at that again in the first Peter that we've done. Okay, have a look at it again. Let me read from step one to four. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walk about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. So step four is whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, so like I said, this step four is actually our victory. This step four is the way out. This is the weapon with which we win. Whom resist? Resist the devil. Resist this enemy and this opponent. But he said, resist whom resisted first in the faith or whom resisted first in your faith. Let's compare that with what we read in First John chapter 5. Verse 4, First John chapter 5, verse 4 says that for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, what? Even our faith. Our faith. He said in that first Peter that we read, whom resist steadfast in the faith. And this is very, very important. This is the way that we overcome. This is the victory that overcomes the world. This is the weapon that brings victory. This is the weapon that brings victory, even our faith, as we resist steadfast in the faith. If we are not in the faith, there's nothing, there's no strength to resist. If we are not in the faith, if I'm not walking by faith, if I'm not living in faith, there will be no strength to be able to resist. But he said, whom resist steadfast in the faith? And that word resist there means to withstand. It means to be firm against the onset of the devil. You want to knit it in the board at the beginning. You don't want evil and wickedness and rebellion to be established. You want to remove the you know the the, the 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 plant before it becomes a tree you want to knit it in the board you want to withstand you want to resist to withstand to be firm against the onset of the devil so so that word resist means to withstand to be firm against it to say no you are not coming in here and the Greek word for steadfast, you remember I said resist, not just resist, steadfastly. That word is emphatic. That word implies solidity, rock-likeness. It's firmness. It's a rock-like firmness. Again, what I'm saying is that you and I cannot have this type of 
emphatic, solid, rock-like firmness. Those things only come by the reason of faith. Amen. So the phrase means to stand and face the devil. So when he says resist steadfast, what he's saying is that stand and face the devil instead of running away from the post of duty and lying still and letting things just go haywire and be chaotic. He said, he's saying be rock-like in your faith. And what we are saying is that it's only faith in Christ that can give us this rock like steadfastness our faith in christ the one foundation the rock on which the christian house is built and it is when we have developed that faith that will be able to resist steadfast in the faith praise the lord now we are going to stop there to the next episode by the grace of god we are now going to apply what we have read here in first peter we are now going to apply it to the case of Cain and we are going to ask ourselves did he really master the sin that crashes at the door did he master it did he do did he follow the instruction that God has mercifully given him and if you are listening to me tonight I just want you to know that Jesus is Lord there is no other name given among men whereby we might be saved but the name Jesus Christ so you can come to him tonight and ask him to save you and he will Ask him to come into your life, to be your, your Lord. He will come in, he will save you by his blood, by his cross. He will come in, take the heart of sin out of you, give you a new heart, a new spirit. You become his property. You become his family. He will walk with you. And when this is all over, you will live eternity with him in the new heaven and new earth. Do it tonight.